the GDP has become a measure of our overall sort of social progress and social health. It's become a, a proxy for a much larger and totalizing measure um, that some of us find, you know, disturbingly inadequate in its, in its dimensions and in its applications. So that's really what today is about. Which areas of policy are most important for improving the well-being of our people? And so but essentially what you have here is uh, a gap between our growth and our well-being as a country. That's a very powerful idea that growth does not necessarily equal progress according to what we really value, going back to on the theory that improving the education, the health, and the environmental quality of a population is the basis for yielding growth in the future, and that accounting for those assets as assets and wealth is very important for policy development, for budget decisions, uh, in a long-term trajectory for growth. Speak to the specifics of sort of what it's like to go beyond GDP in an actual governance setting, and it's not easy. Maybe we ought to think of our economic accounting in a different light, not trying to maximize something that we may never be able to attain, but rather to minimize our regret. It's nice on the individual level, wouldn't it be good if we thought about applying this on a national level, on a macro level? So when we talk about alternatives to the GDP, we have to recognize that we have this huge infrastructure set up to calculate the traditional GDP. So it's a little hard to just throw it away. Much easier to sort of add to it, or just use it to explain certain things, but it still says something. And GDP is not a stock measure, it's a flow measure. What it's measuring is this flow of money going around. Every time money changes hands, you know, I buy some apples at the store, that goes into GDP, okay? It has nothing to do with stock. It's completely about how much money is moving around and that we're not valuing the foundation of all of our wealth, which is the ecosystem. Because as we transform you know, resources into a computer or something, those, those resources are still there. They haven't disappeared. It's just they get all mixed together and it takes a lot of energy to separate everything out again. So we've had this incredibly dense, fantastic usable form of fossil energy, fossil fuels, which have, has allowed this you know, incredible growth in human population and consumption and style of living and house size and food, et cetera, et cetera. But, we've got to stop burning fossil fuels, right? Because that's going to destroy the planet. Ecological economics starts with, what is our ultimate end? What goods do we need to help us achieve these and which of these goods should we choose given our scarce resources? So to me, one of the biggest problems with GDP is it doesn't show this. It measures everything as income, even destruction of our natural capital, which is not income. But at the distribution of income, and we see that things are not necessarily as homogeneous as it is. So being in a country with a high GDP is not necessarily uh, uh, a, a done deal for you as an individual living in this country. The objective of a society is to maximize its happiness and to maximize its utility or its happiness, uh, confusing the two from time to time, but let's say maximizing happiness, which seems to be the target that we are pursuing as an alternative to the GDP. You know, GDP has become the main barometer of social progress and political accountability. Maybe five to ten years that we have in front of us to really begin to shift our accounting, to do full cost accounting in terms of our ecological challenges. And I think the reason why the GDP became what it is is just out of laziness and out of unawareness of what's happening around it. So by, by spending more effort on that aspect through education for the longer term, through uh, information for the short term, through conversation like this one, then you, you, you start changing the direction while we figure out something an alternative to the GDP to, if, if we are interested in finding an alternative. Individuals and businesses already recognize that a lot of our decisions aren't based on maximizing utility, 
about minimizing regret. Governments just need to get on board. The private sector is starting to innovate beyond new ways of exchanging goods and services, which might turn out to be very profitable vis-a-vis -vis traditional GDP terms. You know, we're also seeing impact investment firms. The private firm in the micro economy uh, are trying very hard to develop new measures, precisely, well, analogous to the kinds of measures we're trying to develop at the meta scale or the macro scale. So ultimately, the macroeconomic measurement principles and the microeconomic sustainable measurement principles need to be the same um, because without the larger policy structure shifting in the direction of sustainability, businesses that are trying to be more sustainable um, will have a difficult time. Um, it will be harder and it will grow too slowly. We need to really break the stranglehold of GDP on the capital markets and the only way to do that is to shift the macroeconomic accounting system and ultimately the, de the definitions of value that are embedded in the GDP framework. So sometimes it can just take one person being in the right place at the right time who can really tip the scales and make things quite different. But I do think that with climate change we're going to start seeing uh, some very serious situations which are going to awaken people to the fact that we need to do things differently. There will be a price we're going to pay the, the question now, you know, how, how expensive it's going to be for us to recover. It's hard to imagine this ever being a popular movement where it's a number one priority for governments to start going beyond GDP, but there's a huge space in between in terms of the connections between misleading metrics and policy development where you can imagine communities beginning to get, get involved and beginning to harness the new forms of information coming from people like Maggie and others who are starting to account for these unmeasured goods and services. We're working in a context where we recognize we need to go beyond GDP, but the urgency of it is forced us into a more of a strategic mode. I went to Bhutan thinking that I would write about gross national happiness, and indeed I went there to attend a conference on that subject, given that Bhutan is one of the world's most environmentally enlightened countries. The nation is poor and seeks development, but only on its own terms, not at the expense of its profoundly reverent but vulnerable culture and its fragile, achingly beautiful mountain terrain. This is one of the few carbon negative countries in the world, and yet it is suffering the consequences of climate change in quite a vivid form. Bhutan is the no hunting, no fishing, no billboards, no smoking, no GMOs, no plastic bags, no mountaineering exception to the world as we know it. Arguably the world's only left coast country, certainly one of its most environmentally responsible ones, a quasi-plausible alternative.